what on earth is it? Never seen anything um, quite like that before. We didn't know what it was because it wasn't moving like an aircraft. Most UFO sightings can be dismissed pretty, pretty quickly. Others take a little bit longer, but then there's some that still you know, leave us scratching our heads. Something happened there. I don't know. I think it's put there for some reason, and I cannot understand what it is. August 2000, the skies above Brighton. A strange light is encountered by a police helicopter crew. Could it be a UFO? My name is John Tickner. I was a policeman until um, just a few weeks ago when I retired from Sussex Police, where I've been for 30 years. The last 12 years of my service was on the air support unit, working on the police and ambulance helicopter. As far as I remember, um, it was a, a normal day. It was a, a, a night shift that we do. We'd work through until two o'clock in the morning. And we just had a, a normal shift. It was a fairly clear night, a, a still night, quite a, quite a pleasant, typical August summer evening. We were then heading back towards Shoreham, which is about 12 miles away. It's normal practice for us just to, instead of just going from one place to another and, and focusing on, on the home part, because we're an, an emergency service, we'll listen in to the, the police radios in the towns as we pass them and just generally look about. And what I was doing that night was um, I was operating the, the thermal image camera and just, just looking around, casting around the Brighton area that we're passing over and we're listening to the Brighton radios just to see if anything that was going to happen um, that, that we were ready for and, and briefed about so that uh, we, we knew what was going on. John's crew were nearing the end of their working day on a routine callout. Brighton's revellers below them parted into the night, unaware of the mysterious drama unfolding in the skies. The first thing that happened was, uh, in fact, Sean, the, the paramedic, he was sat in the uh, right-hand rear seat looking out the window, uh, and he was the first one to see just a light. As soon as I saw it, I, I notified the pilot so that he was aware of it, so he could see it in case we needed to get out of the way, and also if he could talk to the pilot and see why they were in our area um, and why they were flying so low. Uh, we then flew round and tried to identify it as soon as we could. But the helicopter pilot was unable to open communications with the other vehicle. Concern grew for whether the object was a danger or not. So I looked out of the window initially and, and saw the light just so I could work out where to take the camera and then brought the camera around onto it to see what the thermal image picture would give me. It didn't have the, the normal, you know, the tail lights and, and the, the flashing lights that you would, you would sort of normally see on an aircraft. So we didn't actually know what it was. With the camera trained on the object, the mystery would surely be solved. What I was expecting to see um, was the shape of an aircraft because that's what we, we normally see um, if we can't work out what the lights are or where they are or where they're going then put it on the thermal Im image camera and you get a lovely silhouette of, of the aircraft uh, or the helicopter uh, and you can actually work out what it is usually but on this occasion I found it on the camera brought the camera around onto it and it was a, a cylinder it's difficult to say how big it was. It's very difficult at night time in the dark to judge a distances and size of things and all we could see was this light so didn't have a clue how big it was. When it's at night you can't tell how close it is you know it could be very very close or it could be very very far in the distance that, that's the problem with any video footage of lights at night. John's camera was now carefully tracking the object's path giving his crew the images they needed to solve the mystery. Initially it did give the impression of moving quite quickly and away from us. So we were kind of moving around. You can actually see that on the video footage that it does seem to be, we do seem to be chasing it around. Um, and that was quite odd to start with that it gave the impression it was moving very fast. We had sight of it and either it passed us or we passed it. It went down the starboard side uh, of our aircraft. We were, we were curious as to what it was. Uh, because we, we need to know, just on safety grounds really, what's in our airspace. It is un very unusual to have anything at that particular height over Brighton, uh, over any town or city. That's 
general aviation is not permitted that low. Commercial aviation is many thousands of feet higher than that. Most kites and, and balloons and things are well below it. It's uh, an area where we, we're normally on our own at that height, so that's, I suppose, what took us a little bit by surprise. We then flew round and it seemed to... Um it gave the impression of moving away from us, and it gave the impression that we were, you know, we were trying to have to chase round to catch it up. There may be a whole reason, a whole variety of reasons why a police aircraft would take an interest in, in something else, certainly another aircraft. Uh, reasons that they may not make public either. The shape was something um, that that I just wanted to try and work out what it was. Working most of the time with the thermal image camera, you like to think you get quite good. I mean, I can't tell you whether it's a Boeing 737 or an Airbus or something, but you can see very clearly, uh, you know, two engines and a, an aircraft. You can see the military helicopters that are sometimes around at low level. That's the only other thing that was going through my mind that it might have been. But you can see the shape of the helicopter, the rotors going around. Uh, the heat from the jetty exhaust, all the things you could see. What I could see here was just one single light in a daylight camera and this, this cylinder shape in the, uh, in the night camera. And it's trying to put those two together just to make some logical sense of, of what we were seeing. We talk about credible witnesses and, um, you know, one of those that you put in that category is, is a police officer. Uh, not only a police officer, but in a helicopter at the time with some very good quality photographic equipment, films an anomalous object at night, both with night vision and ordinary. Um, so that's why you know people become interested in it because police officers, you know, uh, respected members of the community, not likely to make up stories. People are more likely to believe it because it's come from a reliable source. It was something so unique to them when bear in mind they're in the air all the time and they're following this, that and the other, that they perceived it as being extremely strange. Uh, when you see it on the film, it looks extremely bizarre. It's an unusual shape. It quite clearly is there, and it quite clearly gets quite close to their helicopter. It was corroborated by the other people in the helicopter. You know, um, it's a very puzzling case. I was very pleased in some ways uh, to be able to, to record it. If you see something that's slightly different or, or slightly interesting, I mean, the general rule of thumb is no one believes you. And um, I'm, I'm probably included in that same bracket as a, one of life's cynics. Uh, as a policeman and as a pilot, having seen something that I found interesting and, and a little bit out of the ordinary, I was very pleased that at the time I was able to uh, to record it. I actually had the camera on and managed to get this little bit of footage. Photographic video testimony is, is no better than just ordinary eyewitness testimony. The two are combined. I mean, most photographic evidence uh, is submitted when people say, well, I've taken this picture or I've taken this video and they observed something thereafter. It wasn't something they were actually filming. Uh, and without question usually this is something conventional it's just something that's appeared on the film a bird or a photographic fault of some kind um, but the, the good thing about um, photographic evidence is you can actually put it under the microscope so to speak you know witness testimony is fine to a point but you can't examine it any further scientifically whereas a, a film or a photograph you can you can you know, analyze it by a computer take it to the laboratory and so on so it's something a little bit more tangible, which makes it that much, much more interesting. Uh, and um, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll give you some more answers than just what the witness claims to have seen. John tracked the object using the sophisticated technology in the helicopter, hoping to finally identify Brighton's visitor. We've reviewed this tape um, many times and, it, and it's been the subject of uh, much discussion, even a little bit of mirth, I suppose. I'm, I'm happy in my own mind, I know what it is. When you look at footage, uh, I'm very, very uh, cautious to say whether something's a UFO or not as such, i.e. genuine, supposedly ET, um, because it's very difficult to verify. Um, and you can make, you should really only make informed judgments when the analysis has been made.
yet it looks very unusual and I think in this case was treated quite rightly as an unidentified aerial object, which it was, but after investigation it would appear now that there is a credible explanation. Initially we got it on the infrared camera and that you can see on the, on the um on the video footage and that that you know confused us we didn't know what it was then and then we managed to pick it up on the on the normal video camera when you look at the film uh, in in color rather than through the night vision you can see it is a man-made uh, balloon of some kind what it does demonstrate is that that people who are involved in ufo research do not accept things carte blanche you know, uh, you know, you just don't take it as red. Uh, right, that's an alien. It's not like that at all. The close encounter between the helicopter crew and the strange craft lasted about four minutes, but they were still unable to solve the riddle of Brighton's alien visitor. If you see the video, you will see exactly what we saw, no more and no less. And, uh, and you can make up your own mind. In my mind, it's, it's fairly clear. I believe it's a hot air balloon or a lantern, uh, something of that description. Um, who's to say whether I'm right or wrong? I've, I've made up my mind, that's what it is. But, um, I mean, you look at the video, you make up your own mind. I don't know. I think it's put there for some reason, and I cannot understand what it is. Something happened there. The White Horse of Westbury, Wiltshire, an internationally renowned landmark in a county that boasts some of the world's oldest mystical sites. In August 1980, three circles appeared overnight in a cornfield below the horse. It was the beginning of a crop circle phenomenon that provoked intense media attention and a whole generation of hoaxes. Crop circles came to the fore in the early to mid 1980s when some of the national media, national newspapers picked up on them. Headlines such as, as E.T. phoned home, I think, was one of them. So it give you some idea of the time frame we're dealing with. And they've been a subject of hot debate ever since. Freddie Silva is a respected researcher into crop circles. Through scientific investigation, he has developed plausible theories of some mind-boggling concepts. Wiltshire has a uh, very interesting relationship with the crop circles, um, principally because of the location on uh, the earth. Uh, Wiltshire sits on one of the world's deepest uh, aquifers. Uh, it's a chalk aquifer about 400 feet deep. And um, as such, um, the water that trickles through the chalk uh, in itself creates an electromagnetic spin effect. I certainly believe that there are energies within the earth that, again, conventional science tends to ignore or dismiss. If you were to look up crop circle in a dictionary, what you probably find would be something like uh, a perfectly incised area uh, in wheat, rye, barley, whatever. They are areas where the plants are bent an inch above the soil, perfectly laid in uh, waves uh, as if uh, flowing water. There are genuine crop circles, but they are the, the simple circles rather than the, uh, the hieroglyphics and uh, heavens knows what else that we see today in uh, hoax crop circles, you find that the edges are imprecise, that the plants are damaged, that uh, the plants, instead of being perfectly laid, are very waved. I don't mind if people make crop circles if they put the farmers in on it, and it allows people to uh, analyze things from a scientific point of view. Uh, my personal take is that they are a nuisance if they're doing it to try and throw people off the track, which some are. They're trying to tell people that the whole thing is a big joke, it's a big fraud, so why are we wasting our time? On the other hand, uh, if you're looking at this from a scientific point of view, it does give us a barometer with which to uh, judge the real phenomenon by. Because when you look at the man-made ones, you can start looking at the difference. You can start looking at the ground and saying, well, wait a minute, the lay in this particular crop circle is not the same as that one. But are crop circles all hoaxes? While there are many reported incidents of fake circles, others remain unexplained. Local shop owner Ray Barnes has taken walks through Westbury's fields every day since 1979. It was uh, a Saturday early in July 1981. The corn circle started by me noticing a line in the crop just this side of that hedge, and it traveled across the field. It looks, I guess about 50 mile an hour because it's quite wider that field than you think. 
the heads of the corn were jiggling about. They were actually moving. I mean, when you see them over a 50-yard front, it's hard to miss them. I mean, it wasn't just one or two. Everything else was perfectly still. It started at that angle and finished at that angle, so it came round on a radius. Then it just dropped to the ground, described a circle. There's only been, to my knowledge, about 80 people uh, around the world who've seen the crop circles form in about ooh, 15 seconds. So it's, it's good because now it gives us a, some kind of a base which to establish what's happening here. There was no bounce back of the corn heads as it would when a tractor passed it. That was one of the things that surprised me at the time, actually. In Ray's case, where he sees the invisible line snaking across the, uh, the crop and then laying the crop down in four seconds, uh, seems to actually correlate to what's happening on the ground. And again, uh, it also is interesting in that his description of the laying down method, where there's no spring back, means that there's no damage either. And this is what we're finding and relating it uh, to the physical evidence. So I find his uh, cases very, very compelling. I think Ray's account is, is, is unique in my understanding. I've, I've not heard that, that type of description before. The other eyewitnesses to, um, to crop circles forming has been you know, more or less just a puff of wind and a few bits of, of the corn into the air, and, and that's it, it's there. It's, it's, it happens very, very quickly. Had Ray's sighting been by chance, or had he been chosen to witness the rare phenomenon? Why he saw it is unknown, but what he witnessed in 1981 was merely the beginning of his strange relationship with that field. I saw two combine harvesters, and I looked up and decided that in 20 minutes they would finish the field because they were working together, working into the middle. I walked 10 feet, looked up, and they'd packed up, they'd finished. And there was no way they could have combined those last few rows. The roots in uh, plants are supposed to be geotropic. In other words, they move downwards to face the actual point of gravity in the Earth, which is right at the center. Now, in crop circles, uh, what we begin to find is that the roots are actually not growing downwards, they're actually growing horizontally. So, which means that something must have happened here which has altered the actual root structure in a very, very short space of time, which has allowed them to move. Now, time, as uh, physics knows, is something that's related to our gravitational field. If you alter the gravitational field of the Earth, then obviously time has to be affected in some way. Uh, a couple of scientists took clocks, uh, digital clocks, into a crop circle. Uh, one was in the crop circle, one was far away back at home, timed to the same uh, moment, and when they put the two clocks back together, found that 20 minutes had uh, been missing. So clearly there's something going on here. At the start of the 1990s, that same field of corn once again disturbed Ray's peaceful walks. It appeared to have many more secrets to share. I came down here and looked across this field, and it was full of billowing brown smoke from a, from a heath fire down in Dorset. And when it reached this point here, it was held by a wall, by what appeared to be a wall. And over the other side, it was perfectly clear, and you could see the sky and clouds and everything through it. But on this side, you couldn't even see the sky through the thick brown smoke. The smoke just seems to hit this invisible wall, so it actually delineates this invisible tube of energy. Uh, again, uh, this tube has actually been photographed, so we know it's there. We know that uh, um, pilots go across these tubes of energy and their equipment fails, so we know it's there. Around this time, Ray Barnes was contacted by Colin Bloy. Colin studied the practices of divining and had read about Ray's original crop circle sighting because of his interest in the area. He too witnessed the events in the field. Certainly, we, we were able to establish that there were uh, energies in that place which were disturbing normal phenomenon, like shadows, like light, uh, like time. Ray took this photo in the summer of 1990. He had become unsettled once again by what he saw in the field. I noticed that the tree shadows laying across the field where the first corn circle had formed were in fact converging. They weren't parallel. This tree here had a, had a shadow which laid that way across the field. And those two trees up there, their shadows laid this way across the field. The shadows of the trees, instead of being parallel, were all converging on the point of the circle, uh, which is very odd. Um, it can only happen when the energy is a bit strange. Uh, I stopped several 
people. I said, what do you think of those shadows over there? And they said, they're not right, are they? They're not right. I cannot understand what it is. I cannot understand what causes the shadows to go one way, one side of the wall, and the other way, the other side of the wall. These are all things that perhaps indicate uh, an alteration of the local gravitational field. An invisible wall, converging shadows, the desynchronization of time, and the formation of a crop circle. These events were all beyond obvious explanation, but seemed to be connected. I had come down, and I'd actually gone up to photograph the trees on this side of the field to see if the shadows were straight. And then I spotted this corn circle. The main circle was clockwise, and the two on the right-hand side were also clockwise. Now, when that began to sprout again, which was mm, several months later, three, four months later, all the clockwise circles were filled with a yellow rank grass, you know, like the sort of stuff you see growing on the seashore. But the fourth circle, which had gone the other way, anti-clockwise, that was filled with a lush green growth. Over the years, we've had many, many theories as to what it's causing crop circles. Uh, and uh, a lot of them very plausible. Uh, a lot of them were very implausible at the beginning because we didn't know much at the time, and now we do. For example, we started off with things like uh, the uh, weather theory, the plasma vortex theory, uh, part of which I think to be true. I don't have any theories about the wall at all. I think it's connected with the circles. I just don't know what it is. I had to say and conclude that it's not weather, but it's a natural source, uh, which is found all around the Earth, uh, which has been harnessed in a certain way that we are not, not totally aware of yet, and has been used in a certain very specific way, very focused way, to create these interesting shapes. Ray is still disturbed by what he saw, despite the efforts of Freddie Silver and Colin Bloy to explain the phenomenon. So far, no one can say what is creating it and why.